birds are fascinating creatures. You know who else are fascinating creatures? North American teenagers. Like in the book, The Field Guide to the North American Teenager by Ben Phillip. Race relations are central to the YA novel, The Field Guide to the North American Teenager, by Haitian author Ben Phillip. It's refreshing also to find that race relations are not a big deal in the YA novel, The Field Guide to the North American Te Teenager, by Haitian author Ben Phillip. How can these two f conflicting ideas be held in unison throughout Phillip's book? It is possible when you mentally explore the intersection of the two concepts. There are places where two very different things meet, and it's called life happening. No one is either all good or all bad, and it's common in literature to try to explore this question. Ben Phillips' field guide does it well. The reason why I'm being so careful with this is because this lawnmower called an auto sickle is from the 1920s into the 1930s. Believe it or not, lawns were not something an average American had until about 1920. Back in the 1800s and prior, your homestead or house would just have a bare dirt um, surrounding it. Exploring the nature of humans is something that the main character, Norris Kaplan, does throughout the field guide. Every chapter begins with an amusing observation that keeps the theme of someone from the outside looking in rolling along. Why is Norris on the outside? It might be that he's the new kid in a high school college town. It might also be that Norris is a black Canadian hockey player who is smart smart-tongued, and sweating profusely in Austin, Texas, kind of like I am. It could also be surprising that Norris, Norris joins the periphery of the in-crowd so quickly, but then again, being unique is a benefit of natural selection. It is at a house party, absent of all parental influences, that Norris gets to know a girl that's consumed his thoughts since he met on the first day of school. Uh, grass was for animals to eat. It was not something that you put in your front yard. That concept came out of uh, just prior to World War I when um, people had uh, a little more leisure time and then into the 1920s when they really gained quite a bit more leisure time and they realized that uh, one of the things that made a home look nice was a lawn around it. Uh, this was a concept that went back to uh, Versailles Palace where they planted large expanses of grass to show how wealthy they were. Because if you could have grass planted that animals could eat and you just had it there for the look of it, that meant you were immensely wealthy. So in the 1920s and 30s, People latched onto that idea and wanted it surrounding their house. So they had to have some way of cutting it because the animals weren't keeping it trimmed. So this is one solution. It was called the auto sickle because a lawnmower name hadn't been invented yet. A sickle or a sigh is how you cut hay back then. Aardi is a confident, creative, and quite a scholar. She is also the daughter of immigrants like Norris. And being the child of an upward climbing family, she's expected to take her place at an Ivy League school like her brother. That she would rather become a traveling professional photographer adds conflict to the story. It must be hard to live up to expectations. It is hard for Norris and it's hard for Aardi. And it's even hard for the popular white girl Madison. Norris doesn't hit it off well with the school's cheerleaders on his first day and it goes downward from there. Until the second in command cheerleader, Madison McElways, cuts Norris a break by putting in a good word for him 
at her dad's barbecue restaurant called The Boneyard. Things are not going well for Nora socially until she does that. Madison paves the way for Norris to be hired as a busboy and begins a relationship that will prove to be central to the neither all good nor all bad theme. And so it was called the Auto Sickle. And this company in South Natick, Massachusetts patented this. And it uses a series of gears to turn this blade, and there would have been two, it's missing one, to uh, turn this blade and uh, cut the grass in a sort of manner. Now it would have been uh, probably softer grass that it would have been used to cutting. Uh, but um, it, I mean, it works to a fashion. It's kind of a neat piece of history. A common phrase that high school students use is, that's so racist. They use it when something is racist and they use it in situations when it's not racist and they use it when something is just uncomfortable and they use it when they happen to hear, hear the word race. Mostly they use it to apologize in, in a way for simply not understanding how to describe something that is infinitely complex. How does one navigate the modern situation where race is a part of everything we do, yet is never supposed to matter? The main character Norris responds to this question when he tells Eardi, it does not matter and we both know it. It is through Norris's and Madison's friendship that the author Philip explores the deftly played race card. Stereotypes are flirted with, but not leaned on. For example, Norris has a habit of walking the halls of Anderson High School when classes get boring or tedious. And of course, Meredith, the head cheer cheerleader, is a spoiled rich bee. But it's not through the stereotypes that, Phillips, that Philip uh, makes statements. It's through the stereotype busting. The white boss's daughter can be attracted to a black Canadian busboy. A second generation Indian girl can demand to be something other than a Harvard educated doctor. And a self-conscious smart mouth hockey team captain can have an openly gay best friend. It is through these and other paradoxes that the field guide to the American teenager becomes a book that you should read. And uh, this, I guess, is some sort of guard that says auto-sickle. 